Hey, I'm Dr. Tironi Lodog, and I'm so happy to be here with you today to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, actually, multivitamins. All right, I'm on record. I have said that I believe that most people should probably be taking a multivitamin. But you know, if you've been to the store lately, they're not all created equal, are they? I mean, it can be really a challenge to try to find the multivitamin that is right for you. So one of the reasons that I wrote uh, Fortify Your Life was actually to help people try to figure out what vitamins would be most appropriate for them. So I thought I'd give you just a few tips today for you, if you were looking for a multivitamin, how do you go about picking them out? Well, I think the first thing is gender. We're dividing by gender. Men and women have different needs. We even have different recommended daily intakes. And, and then age. But I would start first by gender. What I mean by this is that younger women, younger women, once you begin to menstruate, all the way and through you're done menstruating, you should probably be taking a multivitamin that contains iron. Now, there are different kinds of iron. The iron that's in your multivitamin, if it doesn't cause any problems, you're not noticing any digestive problems or darkening of your stool or anything like that, you're just fine. But for some people, iron can be really hard on the stomach, and it can, it can cause you know, uh, tarry stools or dark stools, and, and, and people don't like it. Women don't take it because they don't like it. If that's the case, I would encourage you to look for a multivitamin that has a food-based type of iron in it. Um, these tend to be much more gentle on the stomach and easy for, for you to digest. But you need it. Uh, uh, women, I tell women, you know, when you're looking at women's multivitamins, you have to think about your age and then your menstrual status because of the iron component, right? That iron is important. Now, sometimes when women go through the perimenopause, that, you know, that, that period that can last from several years to many years where your cycles are getting irregular and you're, you know, you're going through that transition, you're not past menopause yet, you're not through and beyond menopause, you probably still need to be taking iron because women typically have heavy cycles. Even if they're not regular, when they have them, they tend to be kind of heavy. Once you've been you know, a year without having any kind of periods, then you probably can just stop taking a multivitamin that has any iron, right? So that's one of the things to think about. Iron is a big deal. We don't want women, you know, 65, unless somebody has told you to keep taking a, a multivitamin with iron, we don't want you to keep taking it. So really menstruation or pregnancy, um, that's, that's when you want to make sure your multivitamin has got iron. If you're a reproductive aged woman, folic acid is important, right? Folic acid is very important because if you should become pregnant, you wanted to have that folic acid on board probably six months before pregnancy to ensure that you've had adequate levels, all right? So, you know, when do most women, most women aren't planning pregnancy, okay? We're not planning. I mean, we like our pregnancy, but we weren't planning the pregnancy. It's like, oh, we're pregnant. And then what do we do? We wait till we get our pregnancy test, and then we go buy our prenatal vitamin. That's the way it typically works. I'll tell you as somebody who's taken care of a lot of pregnant women in my career. So it is important that women of reproductive age are taking a multivitamin regularly because if you're sexually active and you do become pregnant, you wanted that folic acid on board for months before conception actually occurs. The reason that folic acid is important in pregnancy is because it prevents a particular kind of birth defect. So you've probably heard of things like spina bifida, right? So um, neural tube defects are when there's a problem with the spinal column and the brain and its closure that it doesn't adequately, a neural tube defect means that it didn't close properly. And that happens really between days 21 and sort of days 28 of pregnancy. So if you wait until you're six weeks pregnant to start taking folic acid, the horse has already left the barn, right? You need it prior. This is, one of, this is a really important message. When I was young and in my reproductive time, the uh, March of Dimes was very out there really making sure women knew about folic acid. So this was a huge initiative when I was young. And surveys show that young women today in their 20s know less about the importance of folic acid than women in their 20s during the 1980s. So we've not done a good job with our messaging here about how important it is before you become pregnant. Now, 
You may have been hearing lately a lot of stuff about folic acid, like something called MTHFR, this methyl hydrotetrafolate enzyme that's job is basically to take synthetic folic acid, which is what we put in fortified foods and what we put in vitamins. It's a, it's a synthetic folic acid. That doesn't have any activity. Your body has to actually do something with it to make it active in your body. So when I went to medical school, it was like, surely everybody can just take their folic acid and convert it and do what has to be done with it. Actually, that's not been shown to be true. You know, we're learning a lot about genetic polymorphisms, big fancy name for genetic variation in our ability to metabolize or utilize all kinds of things, medications, drugs, and even things like vitamins. So sometimes you may see multivitamins that have something called L-methylfolate or methylfolate in instead of folic acid. I want you to understand what that is. It basically is just the active form of a folate, right? So you don't have to know if you're one of those 20 to 30 percent of people who can't take folic acid and fully activate it. If you take something like methylfolate, it's already been done for you. Now, a lot of people ask me, uh, patients ask, well, will you test me? Will you do genetic testing to see if I have the MTHFR? And I, I have to tell you, it's not an inexpensive test. It's generally not covered, except under very specific circumstances. And so in, for most people, I think, instead of testing to see if this is what you have, if you're concerned about it, just purchase your multivitamin that's already got the methylated form of folate in it, right? Then you don't have to worry so much about it. But this is, you know, this is an area that's being discussed a lot because, um, are women who take folic acid who have an MTHFR abnormality, a genetic abnormality, which affects somewhere between you know, 20, 30 percent of us, some variation, are they more at risk for having a baby with a birth defect than a woman taking folic acid who doesn't have it? So my own feeling is that I think in the future we're probably just going to, I think most supplement companies are going to move to methylfolate. It only adds a few cents more to the price of the vitamin, and that way you don't have to deal with it. The other question, and people ask me this, and I, I don't know the answer. I, I do not know. I've, I've searched the literature. I, I don't know that anybody really knows the answer. But if you're taking folic acid in fortified foods and in vitamins and your body can't do anything with it, what, what happens to it? Like, what's it doing in the body? It's just non-activated folic acid running around. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if that's good or bad or indifferent. But I think it's one of the reasons, since we're not going to start doing genetic testing, that a lot of people are going to start moving to methylfolate. When women ask me, should I buy a prenatal that has methylfolate, I say, why not? You know, why not? Um, you know, that way your bases are covered, even if you should be. You've got an 80% chance probably that you don't have any problem with this genetic machinery. But if you're one of the 20%, there's no harm in using a methylfolate, right? So does that make sense? So, so but you're hearing, if you're hearing something about MTHFR, that's what we're really talking about here is the ability of your body's genetic machinery to be able to take folic acid, which is synthetic and not active, and making that into an active form in the body. That's what that's really talking about. Related to that is methylcobalamin, which is vitamin B12. And many people are now moving towards a more active form of B12, um, too. And it's sort of related to the same genetic variation that we're talking about. We think it's less common than the problem with fo folic acid. But again, we're talking about pennies of difference. There's, 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 there are reasons to use methylcobalamin, the active form of B12, versus something like cyanocobalamin. Um, and, and so if you're concerned about these things, if you look for a multivitamin, you can look for one that's got methylfolate, you can look for one that's got methylcobalamin, and then you've got your bases covered and you don't have to worry about going and getting genetic testing, right? Because when you go to your doctor and say, would you please test me for MTHFR, they're going to go, why, <laughs> right? And I think the big, the big issue here and, and where I come down to as a primary care provider is if the main reason is if you know 
if it's going to decide which supplement you're going to take, just take the supplement that's already got the active forms. Then you don't have to worry about it. All right. So for women, folic acid is a big issue, but B12 is as well. B12 also is associated with birth defects if you have low vitamin B12. Back when I was catching babies, I didn't really think about women having low B12. But now, many women are overweight or have diabetes, and many women are taking metformin. Metformin is a medication that is often used now for polycystic ovary uh, syndrome, so PCOS. Um, polycystic ovary syndrome is now the most common cause of infertility in women in the United States. And polycystic ovaries are really a result of, of insulin resistance in the body, insulin resistance by the cells. And so metformin is used to treat it. But metformin taken for over a number of years, which is often what happens with women with polycystic ovary, they take it for years, your B12 level can go down. And if you should become pregnant, you don't want low levels of B12. This is just another reason that we want to make sure that you're taking a multivitamin every day if you could get pregnant, right? And a prenatal is actually a really good idea because it's got all the bells and whistles in it that you would look for if you should become pregnant. Before I leave women, a couple other little things. I believe men and women both need choline. How many of you have heard of choline? And you've heard of things like, acetylcholine and phosphatidylcholine and all these kinds of things and you know so choline is actually a member like a member of the B family of vitamins if we were going to make it into a vitamin we'd say it's a member of the B family because of the things that it does well in 2016 in July of 2016 the FDA actually published their new guidance on dietary supplements, and one of the things that they actually for the first time included was a daily value for choline. Never had a daily value for choline, and that's why it's not in very many vitamins. I mean, it's not. If you go pull 30 vitamins off a shelf, multivitamins, you'll find choline in virtually, you know, like a handful of them. So the FDA has set that daily value, they published in their paper, 550 milligrams per day. That's the daily value. Do you know how that level was set? What it was based upon? That actually that is the level that is required to prevent fatty liver. That's how much you need to, to prevent fatty liver disease. So the FDA actually put in their paperwork that this is what you need to keep the liver from having non-alcoholic fatty liver. Now, you're thinking, fatty liver, hmm. Well, you know, fatty liver is something we used to see, gosh, in old people and alcoholics and, you know, old diabetics and that. Now we're seeing fatty liver in 10-year-olds. I was just at a large pedi uh, pediatrics conference and all the pediatricians, there were like 800 pediatricians there, all of them were like, oh yeah, we see this all the time. 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, fatty liver. Now, for me, this was an interesting churn of events, right? We went in 1980, the first dietary guidelines came out for Americans. And what was the big emphasis back then in the 1980s? Low fat. Low fat, low fat, low fat. Remember, eggs were bad. And we said, if you're going to eat eggs, take out the yolk, just use the egg whites, right? Today on menus still, you travel and it'll have the healthy choice, and then it'll have egg whites and spinach and tomato. You know, so, so still, even on our menus, you can see egg yolks are still demonized. Now, what's fascinating to me is that in 1980, we went low fat, and also at that time, eggs were bad. If you look back on Time Magazine, they've got this like picture of like this egg, you know, just demonize this egg and dietary cholesterol. It's, it's crazy. And we started eating a whole lot more carbohydrates. We started eating a lot more carbs, a lot of processed carbs. We just really increased a lot of that in our diet. Where do you get choline from? Egg yolks and livers is the primary places. I'm curious, how many of you when you were kids ate liver a lot? How many of you eat liver a lot now? You could smell the liver cooking in my house. 
He walked in, mom had her iron skillet out, she was cooking that liver, she was so happy, she just thought liver was the best food ever, and we were like, oh God, you know, it's nasty. You know, she liked chicken liver, calves liver, everything, but liver is the highest dietary source of choline, and then whole eggs are, because it's in the yolk. So for me, what was fascinating was when we started moving towards more and more sugar, more and more carbohydrates, and particularly fructose, we started seeing more and more fatty liver, because fructose definitely drives fatty liver. And the ingredient that we needed, the nutrient we needed to actually take fat away from the liver, which is what choline does, remove fat, kind of moves fat out of the liver. That's its part of its job. We got rid of the foods that had it. And then it wasn't in vitamins. Choline was really not found in it. Oh, people that like soy lecithin and things like that, they were getting choline. But for most of the population, we just became very low in choline. So now there is a new daily value, and you're going to start seeing choline in more supplements. So it's not only important for men and women to make sure they're getting adequate amounts of choline, but where it's really important is for pregnant women and for children. So choline is actually added to infant formula, but moms that are breastfeeding, where's that baby getting their choline? You can't give what you do not have. I mean, that's the primary thing for breast milk. It's like, it, it's, you know, breast milk's pretty awesome, by the way. Just know, literally, let's talk about a miracle. You know, you take blood and you make it into milk. That's what happens in, in a woman's body, and that's how she feeds her child. It's like the blood of life. I mean, that's where that comes from. But you cannot give what your body doesn't have. And choline is essential for that baby's neurodevelopment, especially during the first few years of their life. And it's critically important during pregnancy. And we didn't know this, and prenatals didn't have it. And you know, this was one of the key reasons in the, in, in the prenatal that I designed with a company. Uh, I, I said, it's got to have choline in it, because it's so important during pregnancy that moms are getting adequate amounts of this. So choline is something I encourage you to look for in your vitamins, but if you're breastfeeding or you're planning on getting pregnant or you are pregnant, make sure it's got choline in it, at least 300 milligrams or so, to ensure that you're getting adequate levels um, in the body. Last thing on prenatals, last thing before I leave, everybody needs choline, not just pregnant women, but the other big one that you want to look for in a prenatal vitamin for women, iodine. Iodine. Now, you know, you're thinking, gosh, People get too much salt in the United States. They got plenty of iodine, right? But where are most people getting all their sodium from, do you think? Do you think they're getting it in their table shaker at home? No, it's in all that processed food they're eating. And when they go to the restaurant or they go to the fast food place or they're opening up their, their box and their, you know, their prepackaged foods, that's where they're getting all the sodium. But 80% of salt in the United States contains no iodine, and that is what goes into restaurant fast food, and processed foods. It, it's non-iodized salt. So you're getting all that sodium, but you're not getting iodine. The only place you're probably going to really get iodine is in your salt shaker, unless you're somebody that likes seaweeds or sea vegetables, which is another place of getting iodine. But let's be honest, most Americans I know are not into seaweed. You know, I actually think it's a marketing problem. I think we should call it sea vegetables, and it might, might people, you know, seaweed, sea vegetables, you know, I don't know, one seems better. But we're not a society that's probably going to jump on eating a lot of seaweed, so the only place you're going to really get iodine is probably from your salt shaker at home. And most of us have thrown out our salt shakers at home because we've gotten the no salt messages, right? So for the first time, the Centers for Disease Control, in, when they were doing their big um, national survey of Americans, they actually checked the urine of a, you know, thousands of Americans and checked them for iodine levels. And we found that women between the ages of 25 and 39, reproductive-aged women, were borderline iodine insufficient. That was a total shock for most of us that do women's health, because we're like, how could that be? Now, folks, the reason this is a problem is because during pregnancy, you, the body must have sufficient iodine for the baby's neural development. We work, the government of the United States works with many other governments and the WHO uh, to provide iodized salt around the world because we know 
that getting women adequate iodine during pregnancy is the most effective way to reduce mental retardation in the world. Moms who have low iodine that give birth, give birth to babies if it's severe iodine deficiency to cretins. It's a severe form of mental retardation and physical stunting of growth. Even though marginal deficiencies, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics in their journal Pediatrics, says that it lowers the IQ and increases the rate for, of ADHD, which we've seen an explosion of in this country. Could there be a connection? We don't know. I believe there is. Uh, African American women in that study actually had the lowest levels of iodine in their urine. And I believe this is because we've been particularly aggressive in our no salt, low salt messages to that community because of blood pressure. So the American Thyroid Association recommends that all women who are pregnant and breastfeeding take a supplement that provides 150 micrograms of iodine, and that usually is as potassium iodide. That's the way it usually says it on the label. And the reason for that is just what we mentioned, to make sure you're not really deficient in iodine. So that's critically important during pregnancy and in breastfeeding, okay? So, so those are some of the things to think about for women with iron um, specifics, with folic acid, methylfolate, choline across the board, and iodine particularly in pregnancy. Men, I didn't forget you. You're just not as complicated as women. But you knew that already, didn't you? Uh, so for men, uh, again, uh, most men's supplements do not contain iron. If it does, pass it on by, right? If you need supplemental iron because you've got low iron, somebody's tested your blood and you have low iron, then you take an iron supplement. But otherwise, your multivitamin really shouldn't contain any iron. Now, zinc is very important. Zinc, the, the recommended daily intake for men is higher than it is for women because men need more zinc. Why? What's it used to make? Testosterone. So, you know, who has some of the biggest requirement for zinc? Teenage boys, adolescent boys, because they're growing at such a, you know, phenomenal rate, getting all their secondary sexual characteristics. All that is being driven by testosterone. What is one of the symptoms of low, signs of low zinc? Acne. Acne. And you know, so you see sometimes boys with, you know, with the, the, this acne and can be quite, you know, I, I've taken care of so many teenage boys with acne and, I, and girls also. I think we often underestimate the impact that has on self-esteem, confidence, um, when people are struggling with something that's so apparent on their face. So zinc is something you want to be thinking about for, for boys. And we're always thinking about giving our girls a multivitamin because she's menstruating, she could get pregnant, all those kinds of things. And we're sort of like, the boys are fine. Boys are good. I'd say no, boys, boys need their vitamins too. And they need to make sure that they're getting adequate amounts of antioxidants. And zinc is a, is a big, big one for immune health, but also for healthy testosterone production. Later on, if you're partnering with somebody and you're hoping to have a family, I mean, both for men and women, it's, it's very important that you both be in a good state of health, meaning that you're reducing your exposure to environmental toxins, that you're trying to have a pretty good diet. I mean, all of those things. But also, I just want to remind you, sperm motility, sperm health, and sperm numbers all matter. And we're seeing declines in all of them across the board in men in the United States. We think some of this is probably the environment, um, in environmental exposures to things that disrupt Phthalates are particularly bad for men. But it also means it's really important for you to do what you can to have the healthiest kind of sperm um, to have the healthiest pregnancy. You're contributing half, half of that child um, with your sperm. So multivitamins are important, antioxidants, zinc in particular, all of these. And, and there's some evidence that they actually may even help uh, men who are low in those nutrients um, may enhance sperm motility and health and help increase fertility um, in a couple trying to get pregnant. So men, men and women both. Men and women, when you hit 50, B12 becomes very important. It's very difficult to get it in your diet. So age now matters as well. 
Now, the, the amount of B12 you need is infinitesimal. It's in micrograms. It's teeny, teeny, tiny. I actually believe that you need to have probably four to six times the recommended daily intake of, of B12 once you hit 50. So 20, 25 micrograms instead of just a couple. Now, people who are B12 deficient, you're going to see that we recommend much higher doses. But we're talking about just basic multivitamins here. Just try to have something that's got 20, 25 micrograms of B12 in it. You may need more if you're on certain medications, right? And your doctor could help you with that. But B12, B12 becomes difficult to absorb because the older we get, the less stomach acid we produce. And that's what you need to get B12 out of your food, right? So you eat your, you eat your chicken. And it goes in, and your stomach acid acts upon it, and it separates the B12 from the protein. And then you have a little, a little transporter, intrinsic factor, that carries the B12 down to your small intestine where it gets absorbed. So people who are vegans need B12 because they're not eating animal products that contain B12. People who are on proton pump inhibitors, which somebody had mentioned that that can also impact B12. So people who don't have any stomach acid. You eat that chicken, there's no stomach acid. How do you separate the B12? People with autoimmunity, um, autoimmune conditions, often can't make intrinsic factor, right? So there's a lot of things happening, and people taking metformin can't absorb it in their intestine. Do you, all, do you know also what you need to absorb B12? Calcium. You need adequate calcium for you to be able to absorb B12. So there's a lot happening with B12. So if you don't have stomach acid, if you've got an autoimmune condition, if you don't get enough calcium in your diet, it's going to be hard to absorb B12 from your food. If you take it in a supplement, you'll just get it. Okay? So B12 is good. What else? Vitamin D. Vitamin D, you know, try to look for a supplement that's got, you know, somewhere around 1,000 international units of vitamin D3. I mean, really, in your multi, you'd like to have, you know, somewhere around 1,000. Some have 2,000. but you know, somewhere around 1,000, um, because that, that's going to that's gonna give you sort of a baseline amount of vitamin D that you need. Um, I think that many people need to have their vitamin D level checked. If they have dark colored skin, they're not outside very much, they live in northern latitudes, they're pregnant, uh, they take medications that can increase their risk for osteoporosis, I think all of these people should probably have their vitamin D level checked. And then you can dose it accordingly. But otherwise, if we're talking about a basic multivitamin, Look for 1,000 international units of vitamin D or more in your multivitamin. Now, what about calcium and magnesium? Those are important, aren't they? So we should just take those all in our multi as well, right? No. Actually, not a good idea. And part of the reason behind that is that, you know, zinc you need like 15 milligrams of, right? Small. Selenium you need micrograms of. Calcium, 1,000 milligrams. Magnesium, 400 milligrams. These are great big minerals. And if you take them at the same time as you're taking all these little trace minerals and small minerals, you'll block their absorption. So when I see people that are taking these really expensive multivitamins that are like six a day, you know, but all the tablets are the same. They're not in different packets. They're all in the same pills, but you take six of them a day, and they give you like 600, 800 milligrams of calcium. They give you lots of magnesium. I'm just telling you, that's the least effective way to take those minerals. They really are best taken sort of apart. The other thing is calcium and magnesium interact with a number of your medications, so your thyroid and other things. So I tell people, take your multi in the morning, get your calcium and magnesium, and usually take those before bed. Uh, when people are not taking as many medications, take them before you go to bed. Magnesium can help you relax and your muscles relax. And help you maybe sleep a little bit better and soak in calcium. How much calcium sh should you supplement with, do you think? 600? Anybody else have any idea? Depends upon the diet. So you need about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams depending upon your age and gender. And you should know that different countries around the world recommend different amounts of calcium. So the United States has our recommendations. Australia has different recommendations. The Europeans have a different recommendation. We recommend the most calcium of basically any country, us in Canada. Canada kind of hangs out with us when we make those decisions. <laughs> and, and who needs the most calcium? Women over 30 is one. 
teenagers, adolescents. Adolescents are growing huge, phenomenal amounts. So that's why they have the highest recommended daily intake or adequate intake levels that are set. Because they need somewhere between around 12 to 1300 milligrams. Some countries distinguish between men and women, and it may surprise you that the men's calcium in teenage years, the recommendations in some countries are higher than for the woman. Why? Because men are building bigger, stronger, faster bones. They become bigger, they're heavier, so the calcium requirements are high. Who takes most calcium supplements? Women over 50. It's like that's when they all find calcium. It's like, oh yeah, I've gone through menopause, I'm worried about my bones. Folks, osteoporosis is a disease of childhood that manifests in, in older years. It is how well you've built your bones to 25 years of age. After that, you're not in the process of making big, strong, healthy bones. So you got to do it all at those young ages. And so, you know, it, it's cute. I, I'll have moms come in, and, you know, who are 52, and they're like, I'm taking 600 milligrams of calcium and my vitamin D. And then I'm like, oh, and you've got a teenage daughter. You know, is she taking calcium? And it's like, no, she doesn't take any supplements. There's a disconnect here. When I was a kid, we drank lots of milk. White or chocolate. That's what it was. We'd go to school, and you got your white or chocolate. And of course, we all got chocolate. Who wanted white milk? I mean, you know, so we all got chocolate milk. But everybody drank milk because that's just kind of what it was back then. Nobody drank sodas at school or juice or things. It just wasn't available. It was the water fountain or milk. And, and too bad for you if you were lactose intolerant, right? I mean, that's just kind of the way it was. Today, a lot of kids don't drink milk. Some people can't tolerate it. Let's be really clear. They, 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 you know, they, they're either allergic to the proteins in milk or they're lactose intolerant. But that was a primary way of getting calcium into a lot of people. And so it's fine not to drink milk. But you have to think, where are you going to get all that calcium from? You need somewhere around 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams for most of us every day. So supplementing may be important. But I tell people uh, in my book, Fortify Your Life, I put a calcium calculator, which is just a down and dirty way of sort of saying, you know, how many servings of tofu do you eat? You know, how many servings of vegetables do you get in a day? How many servings of dairy, yogurt, et cetera? And then you supplement the difference. So if on average you're getting 800 milligrams of calcium a day, you don't need a whole lot, two, 300 milligrams, all you need. But if you're somebody with very low calcium intake, you're probably going to need a higher supplement. So that, that's one of the things there. So vitamin, uh, uh, vitamin D and calcium and then their partner, vitamin K, which most of your multivitamins should contain good amount of vitamin K. Vitamin K was always the missing piece. And it's why I, I recommend multivitamins. I recommend multis because they have everything in them, right? They got everything in them. They all partner together. But you know, we went really crazy with the calcium supplements. Calcium, calcium, calcium. And all these people started taking calcium. All, all these older women started taking calcium. And then we were like, oh, they need vitamin D. They're low in vitamin D because you need that to absorb all this calcium. So we started throwing lots of vitamin D at people. So now they're taking all this calcium and vitamin D. And when we had what we called the calcium paradox, it's like, gee, we're giving them all this calcium and vitamin D, but it doesn't seem to be going into their bones. It's going like everywhere else. It's giving them kidney stones. Maybe they're getting some calcifications in their blood vessels. But gee, it's not having all the effect on bones that we thought it should. Well, hello, there's a, another little piece there. I mean, there's magnesium and other. But if, there's, if you were going to look at the other big player here, it's vitamin K, and particularly vitamin K2, right? So. You take in calcium into the diet, goes into the intestine. If your body needs calcium, vitamin D is activated, and then you absorb the calcium, right? So vitamin D is needed to actually absorb the calcium. It helps regulate it. But now you got the calcium in your blood vessels, and you want it to get to the bone, and that's where vitamin K2 comes in. Vitamin K2 does two things. One, it activates something in your bone called osteocalcin, and that's like the door to the bone that allows you to take the calcium up into the bone. So it's sort of like the, it's the, the, the cop out there saying, OK, open the door, let the calcium into the bone. The other thing it does as a traffic cop is it's actually in the blood where it activates a particular kind of protein where that actually prevents the calcium from laying down in the blood vessels and directs it to the bone. So, Vitamin K2 is very important for making sure your calcium is going to where it needs to go. 
And we just didn't pay attention to that. People started taking lots of calcium supplements, then they started taking lots of vitamin D, and nobody was taking a multivitamin. And that was probably the only place they were really going to get that K2. You get it in your diet. Your body can technically make K2 from K1. There's different kinds of vitamin K. So your body, most of what we get in our diet from green leafy vegetables, and that is K1. If you have the right bacteria, you can convert that to K2. Not everybody has the right bacteria, right? You can get K2 by eating fermented foods and also from certain cheeses. I'm a huge fan of cheese if you don't have a problem with cheese. Cheese and yogurt both contain bacteria. And that cheese and that yogurt, that bacteria in there is very, very good for the, the, mi the microbes that live inside of you. And so I really encourage people, if they don't have a problem with cheese uh, and, they, and they like yogurt, to include those in their diet. They're good sources of calcium, but they're also very, very good for our microbiome. So, so vitamin K, K1, K2, um, th you'll find those in vitamins. Um, I actually like the blend. I like the K1, K2. I like kind of having both of them in the vitamin. That way I know that we're going to get some, including the, the, the active form, that's really necessary for bone health. So you can see that there's an awful lot in a multivitamin to think about in there. I mean, when you really stop and think about what you're looking and how much you need and not getting too much calcium, magnesium in here, but making sure you're getting enough K2 and all those kind of little details. And so it's why I think um, you want to do some investigation. When you're buying that multivitamin, when you're making the decision to go out, you want to think ahead of time, a little checklist, like what do I want in my multivitamin? What do I need? You know, what, what do I need? And do I need something extra, like an omega-3 or things like that? And then when you go in, make sure that you're asking the person at the store to help you be able to find a multivitamin that's got, that checks these boxes, right? The last thing I'll say about multivitamins is, you know, you don't have to spend, you know, $200 a month on a multivitamin. On the other hand, you know, I don't eat really cheap food. I mean processed food with all kinds of, you know, fillers in it and artificial colors and all kinds of stuff like that. I don't want a multivitamin that's got all that stuff in it either. I don't want it that's got, you know, tons of binders and fillers and artificial colors and it. it's not consistent with the way I would eat so it's not consistent with what I want in my multivitamin so you know I spend a little bit more on my multivitamin because um, I'm worth it because I'm worth it I, I like to have good quality supplements also from a manufacturer that I really trust so I would tell you that a multivitamin is like a part of your insurance policy that you take it most days of the week, if you forget it here or there, it's okay, but taking them most days of the week, most of the time, over most of your life, I think will give you the insurance that you need to make sure that if you're not eating as well as you should, or you're under a high stress job, or you're taking certain medications that may be wiping out certain nutrients, that you're going to have what you need for your body to function well. So invest in yourself, Invest in a good multivitamin. Use the tips that I gave you. Um, the book Fortify Your Life can also be helpful to you because it goes through in great detail how you sort of can select these based on your own personal needs. But, you know, if you're not going to invest in yourself, who is? I mean, truly, I think self-care is self-preservation. It's like, you know, you live in a life. Life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you've got to be preparing today for the next 30, 40, 50 years of your life. And the way you do that is by making sure that your body is not under additional stress because it's missing key nutrients that it needs for it to do all of the things that it has to do every day to function well. So I hope this has been useful. I hope I gave you some information maybe that you didn't know or that you hadn't thought of. Go and have a, a good day for the rest of your life. Thank you. We taking a few questions? All right. What you got? What you got for me? Hi. Thank Hi you there. so much. Um, my question is, for anyone who doesn't have access to the resources they might need to understand what they need in their multivitamin, are there any that contradict one another? Can you just take a whole bunch, or, or should you avoid certain ones together? So um, the question was really about 
you know, can you take them all together? Um, well, we clarified one, like great big minerals like calcium and, ma and, and magnesium, where those actually, those actually will block sort of the absorption of some of the smaller ones. Um, calcium makes it difficult for your body to take up iron, right? Um, vitamin C actually in food, it's like when you, you know, when you have vitamin C along with food that contains iron, especially plant-based iron, you're going to enhance the absorption of that iron. So nutrients partner together um, in ways that, that, that are very beneficial for us. In foods, you don't have to worry this, about this so much, but when you start taking supplements at larger amounts, that's when you have to start looking at, am I taking something that's going to sort of interfere with the absorption? Like you're not going to take 600 milligrams of calcium at the same time that you take your iron pill for your anemia, right? Because they'll block each other. The other thing is that some, some of these big minerals in particular, like calcium and magnesium, also can impair the absorption of certain medications, which is why they're often, we recommend taking them two hours apart, at least two hours apart. So, um, you know, Vitamin D, if you're taking additional vitamin D, it's best taken at dinner. There was a study actually showed that if you take your vitamin D at dinner versus at breakfast, you get about a 50% greater absorption, and that's because people typically eat more fat with dinner. So fat-soluble vitamins are better absorbed when they're actually consumed with a meal that contains fat. Uh, Omega-3s also, take your omega-3s with dinner. That's a good time to take those. So um, I wouldn't get overly worried about uh, too many things interacting with each other, um, but I, I would say your, your big things like calcium and magnesium, they, they tend to be more problematic with medications and very small amounts of trace minerals. Sort of take them a bit separate. And if you're taking fat-soluble vitamins like a vitamin D separately, somebody's told you to take additional vitamin D or you're taking an extra thousand, take that at dinner um, uh, to give it with the, the biggest fatty meal that you've got. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. What else? My question is, is I know since we work at the vitamin shop, um, the one thing I've realized is, is specific companies have specific promises. Uh, for example, I know um, like Garden of Life is known for their raw, um, and then other companies like Mega Food are known for farm to table. Are there any promises that really stick out to you that you should look for in a multivitamin, things that are agriculturally important in your multivitamin? So the question is really around sort of values kind of promises but values, right? So, um, and, and I think that people want to purchase a supplement that's consistent with their own values, right? So um, for me, organic, um, I like organic and I, I like pur purchase things that are organic. Um, I don't like a lot of pixie dust in my supplements, I'll be really honest. So when I see a supplement that has a high price tag on it and is essentially the same as the vitamin next to it, but then it's got 120 milligrams of broccoli, spinach, carrots, tomatoes, nettle leaf, raspberry, ginseng, you know, you name it, 120 milligrams of 20 different things doesn't amount to anything. It's just not enough to be meaningful. It's more of a marketing term. And, and so I'm a little cautious when I see people investing a lot in marketing um, and then charging me a pretty price for it. Um, I, I don't like that. Um, so, but, but that's me. For some people, they're like, I want that 120 milligrams. But, but you know, I asked, I asked a company once that had like, um, it had like three or five milligrams of blueberry in it. And I said, so, how many milligrams of blueberries is like in a cup of just fresh blueberries, you know? She's like, I don't know. I said 22,000. So three milligrams is like what? Like one sixteenth of one berry or? <laughs> and, and you know, and she kind of looked at me and I said, so is it meaningful or is that misleading? These are important questions, right? So I, I think, you know, and it doesn't mean that that's not the best vitamin in the world. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, that um, sometimes promises or what is marketed to you are really meaningful. They're values-based. They're organic or they're gluten-free if you can't have gluten or they don't have lactose or they're soy-free, especially for allergens. Those things are very important. And so you have to find for yourself what is meaningful and what shares your values. But you have to separate that out from maybe marketing. You know, what is values-based and then sort of what's marketing that's to appeal to you as a consumer because it's saying it's giving you all these things. And as a physician, I'll tell you there's a downside to this too because 
while I recognize 120 milligrams of 20 things isn't going to be beneficial, but also not going to be dangerous, um, when you take that into a physician and they see things like ginseng or licorice or they see something on there or chase tree in a woman's um, multi, then they're like, you shouldn't take that. It can interfere with your birth control pills. You shouldn't take that because you have high blood pressure. It can also be a problem because when health professionals are just looking at the ingredients, they're not thinking, oh, 120 milligrams, that's not going to be enough of these 20 things. It only means each thing's like three milligrams. So it, it can be a twin-edge store. It, it, sort. It can be a marketing that, that doesn't give benefit, but actually when you take it to a health professional, they may tell you not to take it because they're concerned about those herbs. So values-based, buy based on your values, support initiatives that are important to you, check for allergens, um, things like that. If you wouldn't put red food coloring in your, if you wouldn't eat something with red food dye or yellow food dye, don't buy a supplement that's got those things in it. So shop consistent with your values, but be able to distinguish, be a savvy consumer, distinguish marketing from values-based shopping. Thank you. So you've talked a lot about uh, deficiency levels with vitamins and minerals, and I was wondering for the average person, how often should you get those levels checked? So the question's really around getting your levels checked. Well, first of all, they're never checked unless there's something really wrong, right? Um, because we don't think about nutrient testing. So we might check, uh, you know, if somebody's on diuretics, we follow their potassium, right? Um, because we know that can be really dangerous if it goes low. Uh, but we're not typically following magnesium or zinc, which also are depleted by diuretics. So, you know, so, so we have a long way to go when we're thinking about really monitoring for nutrient deficiencies. Um, I, think, I think science does move us forward, and pretty soon we begin to know who should we check vitamin D for. Let me give you an example. When I went through medical school, when I went through my medical training, I was taught vitamin D was fat-soluble and dangerous and that you should never take too much vitamin D. And, and that was a huge thing when, in my medical training. And, and you have to remember that because everybody that went through school with me or before me got the same message, right? It can be toxic and you've got to be careful with it. And so when the Institute of Medicine said you could take up to 4,000 a day, that that was the upper tolerable limit, that you know you take 4,000 a day without any sort of supervision and you'd be okay, we were like, oh my gosh, you know. We were like at 400 international units, 4,000, oh my gosh. But now we know, right? We know that vitamin D is much more safe. We actually have guidelines now from the Endocrine Society about who should be checked and monitored. We have levels that can be set. But in an environment where politics and economics and public policies are all in place, should we test everybody? Probably not, because that would cost a lot of money. But I believe that some of these tests should be available for people to purchase on their own. I think that panels, nutrient panels, should be available for people that don't have to go through a doctor. Um, this, is, this is food. This is nutrients. I think that I should be able to get my vitamin D level checked, or my magnesium, or my vitamin C if I want it. I should be able to get it checked. Um, so I, I think that when you ask the question, how often should they be checked, um, that's impossible to answer since nobody's checking them now. Um, vitamin D, I do recommend if you're in one of the risk groups that I mentioned earlier, that you have it checked predominantly in the winter between December and March is when it's best to, to check the vitamin D level. And then if it's low, you don't know how many people I hear, they're like, oh, I was given 50,000 once a week for eight weeks, and then they just told me to take 1,000. Uh, and I'm like, did you go back and get it checked? And they're like, no, they said I didn't need to check it. Um, you should insist that it be rechecked because if it's not in the normal range, you need to continue doing it for additional time. Um, if you have any memory problems, memory loss, tingling, you're on metformin, um, you're on long-term proton pump inhibitors, make sure you're asking for your B12 levels to be checked probably once a year um, to make sure that your B12s are not getting low. Um, so things like that. Um, Omega-3 index, I think, is going to be another big one. Um, you know, Bernadine Healy was, um, she was uh, president of the American Heart Association, she's a cardiologist, and then she was the head of the National Institutes of Health. She was a rock star, is a rock star. 
so women researchers and scientists and doctors like me, like we love to see this. She actually, in the 1980s, talk about how prescient she was. Um, she said, in the 1980s, there will come a time, uh, maybe not a direct quote, but it's almost what she said, um, there will come a time when knowing your omega-3 index will be as important as knowing your cholesterol number. And that whole thing about knowing how much omega-3 you have. So are you actually eating enough fish? Are you getting enough omega-3? Um, I, I would think anybody that has significant risk for heart disease, anybody who's had a heart attack, anybody with heart failure, anybody with th this kind of thing should definitely have their omega-3 index. I had mine done as part of a group thing. I, I don't have heart disease. And it's supposed to be between 6 and 8, or preferably better than 8. <laughs> mine was 4.2. So I, I, mine was in the like danger zone. I'm like, how could it be? I eat flax, I have walnuts, I eat fish. But do you see, so sometimes even when we think we're getting enough of something, when you get an objective measurement, it tells you you're not. So um, I see a time when maybe companies have really, um, have really worked to make more nutritional testing available to the general public. And if I got a $2,500 deductible, why can't I take $300 of that and get my nutrition panel uh, done from a lab, whether it was ordered from a doctor or whether I ordered it for myself? I want to own my health. I want to take care of my health. And part of that may mean that I want to have some baseline numbers about where my nutrition is. So I hope today you got something from our time together that you can use that will maybe make a difference for you, your family, or a customer that's part of your community that comes in looking for your help.